Today is Thursday, June 3rd, 2021. If you can believe it's that date already, uh, welcome to the Community of Practice on Homelessness. I'm Kevin Lindemood with Healthcare for the Homeless. The poll on your screen will be closing momentarily. So I ask you to uh, complete it if you haven't done so already. Uh, the polls will be featured throughout our conversation today and really help to engage uh, you more in this discussion uh, to allow our panelists to reflect upon poll results. Um, all polls are completely anonymous, so please uh, do not hesitate to take them as soon as they appear. Ross Hackett is behind the scenes managing these polls. Ross, why don't you... Uh, go ahead and show the results. Which description best fits you? I see about a quarter are uh, describe themselves as advocates or community members, um, some educators, a few more elected officials, faith leaders, uh, government employees, about, about a quarter uh, healthcare providers, uh, non government, uh, philanthropy, public health researcher uh, represented among our group today. Welcome to everybody. And before we move forward with today's conversation, uh, Ross, let's launch our second poll. There it is. Over the last few decades, the US has achieved racial progress because choose all that apply. See that people are still joining our discussion today. As you join, please direct your attention to the poll on your screen. This is multiple choice and you can choose as, as many as you'd like. So I, uh, I did note that right out of the gate, about 75% of respondents uh, first selected. I, I don't believe that the US has achieved quote unquote racial progress. And then other answers coming in. All right, there are our poll results with 60% with of respondents, nonetheless, um, questioning the, um, the belief of progress. And we'll reflect more on that today. As I mentioned before, live polls like this will be launched throughout the discussion. Um, less than two years ago in 2019, 150 community leaders representing more than 100 organizations gathered for a day-long community convening on homelessness. We concluded throughout that the problem uh, was not and is not homelessness itself, but rather the systems, structures, and policies that produce it, not by accident, but by design. When we challenged ourselves to continue the dialogue and movement toward collective action, we came face to face with not one, but two pandemics. COVID-19 causing disproportionate harm to black and brown communities. And secondly, the persistence and insidiousness of racism in our policies, in our organizations, in our systems and in institutions and in ourselves. The first community of practice conversation on racial inequities in healthcare took place, it's hard to believe, one year ago this month. Other topics followed, race, housing and health, policing and community trust, food insecurity, race and access. And in April, just a month and a half ago or so, the first session of reimagining restorative justice through the lens of eliminating structural racism. Last month marked one year since the murder of George Floyd by the knee of law enforcement. Earlier this week marked 100 years since the Tulsa massacre, the wholesale destruction of one of the most thriving black communities at the time in the US. Right now, thousands of Baltimoreans experience homelessness, disproportionately black and brown people, with more people poised uh, 
um, for eviction and homelessness in the weeks and months ahead. The structures that drive these realities, they, they aren't 100 years old or a year behind us. They're happening and perpetuating right now. It's all happening against the troubling backdrop of what I can only call the politicization of objective reality keeping a noted journalist from receiving tenure, prohibiting a reanalysis of our history through a racial equity lens in classroom teaching and on and on. In part one of this discussion, we explored flaws in systems of retributive justice, a type of justice based on punishment for wrongdoing. Indeed, the form of justice most commonly associated with our nation's criminal justice system. And we explored restorative justice, a model of justice which tries to repair harm and restore relationships. I'm so excited to continue this conversation with part two. Uh, what we have today, the basic order of agenda is far more like a fireside chat than a panel or a webinar. Uh, there are tools and links in the chat box in real time. Uh, we will spend time on questions and answers. So I draw your attention uh, both to the chat box function, box function and to the Q&A um, function and, and encourage you to make use of both uh, along with the interactive polls that will pop up on our screens. Uh, now I'm very excited to introduce our speakers. Um, first, coming back for our uh, part two, a participant in part one, Tara Andrews Huffman, a, an attorney and director of the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Program of the Open Society Institute, Baltimore. Welcome, Tara. Uh, Seema Ayer, associate director and research assistant professor at the Jacob France Institute at the University of Baltimore. Um, Seema, I believe you participated in the very first community convening on homelessness. Um, uh, about a year and a half ago. We're so glad to have you as a part of, of this conversation. Uh, the Reverend S. Todd Yeary, um, Senior Pastor of Douglas Memorial Community Church, Senior Vice President and Chief of Global Policy for the Rainbow Push Coalition. Talk about observing, Dr. Yeary, the politicization of objective reality up close. Very, very interested in your work on that national level. Uh, and you, Dr. Yeary, were a part of our very first community of practice um, a year ago this month. And it is a, a pleasure to have you back in this conversation. Uh, and Karen York, uh, also returning to the community of practice, the CEO of the Job Opportunities Task Force, um, a panelist in, in our session on policing and community trauma last October. I will ask each speaker to start us off the same question with a time allotment for about five minutes and would ask that speakers introduce themselves within the context of answering the question. So here we go. In our last community of practice session, we ended with a, with a whole set of questions. Uh, what happens if the very foundations of our systems were built upon a white supremacist culture meant to give advantage to some and deliberately disadvantage to others, where racial inequities that lead to homelessness, health disparities, and criminal activity are continuously perpetuated. Is reform enough in these systems? If not, what if we reimagined restorative justice in a manner that identified that structural racism is the actual crime and offense in this context? Who then are the victims? And what does restoration now entail? Um, Tara Huffman and Councilman John Bullock provided us insightful answers uh, to this set of questions. Now I'd like to continue the conversation by exploring a related set of questions. Why are white supremacist culture and ideology so difficult to confront and address for white people and even for people of color? How do these realities serve as a threat to reimagining restorative justice in a manner that identifies structural racism as the crime and offense in systems that are built by white supremacy? Um, let's think about that for a second. How do these realities serve as a threat 
to reimagining restorative justice in a manner that identifies structural racism as the actual crime and offense in systems built by white supremacy. Coming back for part two, let's start with you, Ms. Tara Huffman. I think one reason why it's so difficult to confront and particularly for um, those who identify as white um, to confront um, is one is that uh, all Americans have been told a story from the day that they were born. And depending on who you are uh, determines what story you have been told. Um, and so if you're a white American or someone who identifies as white, the story that you've been told about America and about non-white people um, is one that uh, uh, tells you that, um, you know, white Americans, you know, there may, maybe if you, if you give uh, any nod to the history of slavery in the United States of America, it's with a passing nod. And then you sort of move on <laughs> and says, yes, that was a dark period in our history, if you ever acknowledge it at all, but we're beyond that. Um, and there is something uh, within that story, either uh, very blatantly or subtly, there is the message that those who are non-white, there's something fundamentally wrong, right? There's something fundamentally evil, something fundamentally inferior, something fundamentally immoral, something fundamentally, you know, unable to uh, succeed, um, have a different moral value or a moral um, uh, balance, um, and therefore not like us, um, not quite like us, um, or again, any story that you're told about white America is very apologetic. It's, a bit, so it's an apologist story even for America's dark history. And, and, and being someone you know, who's uh, you know, 47 knocking on 48, it, it's only, I would say recently, recently in the last few years that I'm coming to understand just how, in, how consistent um, and how insidious that storytelling is to all of us from the moment of our birth and it's built into our educational system. Um, so you get it at home and then it's reinforced at school or vice versa. Um, and so if that is the story you've been told all your life, when someone tries to tell you a different story, it, it is almost like dissonant, right? It's like, it's like your mind will not receive and compute what the other person is trying to tell you. Um, and then I would just add to that, that it's also difficult um, for America, white America in particular, to confront the racist history of this nation because by confronting it, if I confront it, own up to it, give any place to it, then I also have to confront the fact that I have benefited from it. And what does that mean? What does that mean for me personally? Right? Does that mean that I'm not as smart as I thought I was? I'm not as successful? I'm not as deserving of what I have been able to attain in my life as I thought I was because it was actually my whiteness that got me there and not my own intellect, my own ingenuity, my own um, fortuitiveness, you know, any of those things. And so it becomes very personal, right? So it becomes personal to me in terms of it doesn't agree with the story I've been told about this country and about non-whites my entire life. And then if I start to confront it, what does that mean about me? And I'm not, it's very hard um, for me to accept what that may mean about me and my place in this world and my place in this country and my place in, in the community if you start to assign too much of it to my whiteness as opposed to me as an individual. So I'll, I'll start the conversation there. So uh, that's a wonderful place to start. And, and thank you, uh, Tara Huffman, uh, the identifying the cognitive dissonance, if you will, that is um, uh, so many of us are, are facing or, or not uh, facing sufficiently. Um, let's, let's turn to Dr. Seema Ayer. Um, and I will repeat part of this question. Why are white supremacist culture and ideology so difficult to identify, confront, and address? How do these realities serve as a threat to reimagining restorative justice in a manner that identifies structural racism as the actual crime and offense in a system built by white supremacy? Dr. Ayer, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin, and the rest of the team at Healthcare for the Homeless, and what a great uh, 
great work you guys are doing to bring us together to have these conversations and I appreciate being a part of it. Um, you know, it's absolutely true what Tara's talking about. It's about controlling the narrative, right? And the, the problem was that we are in a country where the narrative was completely controlled um, by non-white exclusion, right? And so the result of which is white supremacy. Um, you know, not having other voices in the room, not having, not valuing other voices in the creation of so many of our systems and so many of our policies and so many of our laws um, and really, you know, assuming that the exclusion of the non-white was okay, right? Uh, and, um, and here we are. So it's a little bit of this idea of first, first man in, right? Literally first man in, <laughs> first white man in, uh, gets to control everything else that ensues beyond that. And we're just not that country. We've never been that country. Um, and it's just more evident even now. Um, so just by way of who I am, I oversee a project called the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance at the University of Baltimore. And we basically track all kinds of community indicators and you can see the, the insanely sad level of segregation that continues to exist in our city because uh, we, we all can't seem to figure out how to live together and not necessarily because we don't personally, uh, there's a little bit of personal bias, but we have such systemic biases that essentially throw us apart. You know, some people that can and cannot get a mortgage based on color. Um, some people that cannot cannot buy a house based on color. Um, some people that can or cannot get a job based on color and over and over and over again and what happens is that we can't even live together uh, because of the policies that we have and that is a that's a tragedy of you know astounding proportions because until we learn to live together none of these things are going to change and if our policies keep kind of we have to actually be intentional to to figure out how to get, live together because right now, the natural state of our policies will continue segregation. And we have to be intentional to reverse that and actually get to some level of integration. And the reason why that's so important is because we are living with systems and policies and laws that were created with white men in mind uh, at the exclusion of non-white folks. Um, and that is the system that we are in. It's a it's an entrenched bureaucracy, right? This is bureaucratic theory. Like once you start a bureaucracy, it stays a bureaucracy. Uh, and you can see that in so many things of our cities, of our governments, of our, of our businesses, of our laws. Um, and we have to break that out to actually get in. And, and if we truly believe that we are a pluralistic society, democratic pluralistic society, we have got to figure out how to see each other, build coalitions, understand where we have common ground um, because otherwise we're never going to change anything and we're never going to be truly a one um, you know democratic society where there truly is equal access and truly is equal opportunity and if that's what we want to be we've got to break that out and to the point you know Tara is so so right when you when you learn the history um, you do think about you know how 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 could any of us have potentially benefited from anything, right? And I don't, I don't want to live in a country where I might have gained something at the expense of somebody else. Um, that's not fair. That's not a meritocracy. That's not, that's not uh, in a Hindu philosophy. I'm a Hindu. They, it's called, you know, you're, you're not supposed to do any harm to other living creatures. And I don't want to be doing harm to other people. So I don't want, I feel like that's, that's where I feel like we should be going, that it's not an either or proposition, like if I benefit, you must be squashed. <laughs> it's that we can all benefit and how do we get there? Thank you, Dr. Ayer. I, I find myself um, moved by your um, comment that we can't even live together. And, and that being a, a tragedy of astounding uh, proportions. And indeed it is. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ayer. Um, coming back from California, looks like San Francisco there behind you, uh, but actually from right here in Baltimore City, the Reverend Todd Yeary. Uh, welcome back, Dr. Yeary. Uh, 
for well, Kevin Lindemood, my my brother from another mother, and to all of my sisters from other misters on the panel, and to all of you who uh, join us today, this is an important conversation, and I'm grateful to you, Kevin, and the team at Healthcare for the Homeless for continuing to keep the conversation going. Typically, what we see uh, after crises like uh, George Floyd a year ago, about the same time, uh, Breonna Taylor, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Police violence has continued to plague the country. It is not a new phenomenon, but it is uh, the, the latest incentive, much like the Kerner Commission report, that the dis-ease that we see in cities and towns and rural areas across the country are often triggered, if you will, by police encounters. So it's an important conversation and it's very current. I also want to uh, congratulate uh, my colleagues, my sisters on the panel for the credibility of their, their work that they already do uh, in these arenas. I don't think we should uh, get too far in the discussion without acknowledging that uh, Tara Huffman at OSI, Simei Ayer, and the data that she produces every year with Binya is, it, it makes it hard for Baltimore to deny its condition. And then of course, Karen York and her fierce advocacy and job opportunities task force. Uh, she won't return my call, but that's a whole other thing. I know we've been in a pandemic, but I had to I figured I'd slide that in uh, at the beginning. Let, let's, here's where I would start with your question, Kevin, about, um, this notion of white supremacy, right? Uh, what would it look like if white supremacy were baked into uh, the fabric of the nation? It looks like this, it's called today. We need look no further than the ongoing public denial of a riot and an insurrection at the Capitol on January the 6th that will not be affirmed in the same week that we are marking the 100th year of racial terror perpetrated by the government that was covered up. Let's remember that when the report came out about Tulsa, it acknowledged that there was intentional government hiding, mistruths, misrepresentations about what happened in Tulsa. The reason we have these issues is because even within the, the notion of the social construction of race, this false myth, this fiction called whiteness, that it would create such a sense of entitlement that the government itself would be a co-conspirator in the bombing of a section of a US city. And at some point, there's an outrage that ought be somewhat automatic, that we are still commemorating that and we're seeing different forms of it, not with bombs per se, but with militarization of paramilitary forces that we call law enforcement across the country and all of the stuff that goes along with it. This, this notion of entitlement, the issue I think starts with this notion of understanding we've all been hustled. As a matter of fact, uh, our late brother, uh, uh, Malcolm X said, we've been bamboozled. The bamboozling is this, in the, in, in the preamble to the constitution, there are three words for which there's never been a credible discussion about who did that actually reference. We, the people. People is not just some generic term, it's a legal category, it had value, and it was not all inclusive. Uh, African captives knew it, women knew it. Uh, and so the reality is this notion of the privilege of white entitlement by way of self-classification has been an ever evolving kind of tricky, slippery slope that we don't want to acknowledge keeps all of us in this a gerbil on the wheel exercise that we figure if we keep talking about it and keep moving, we're somehow gonna make progress without ever changing the foundational assumptions about where we are. That is our fundamental challenge. And until we deal with it, I will just say that as we get started, we ought to all start with a moment of confession that we've been hustled. We've been hustled by white racial economic entitlement at the top of the class. 
And we have been caught in this fight below the top of the class over the scraps that are therefore left. And until we resolve that hustle, we're gonna to continue to have these conversations, but the issue is never gonna get resolved, which is why the legislative process is so critical. Dr. Yuri, what, what is the distance between June 1st, 1921 and January 6th, 2020? What's the distance? Uh, let me give it to you by way of a metaphor. There's a book called Without Sanctuary. It is a pictorial history of lynching in the United States where folks would gather after they had gone to Sunday worship and stand in front of black bodies hanging from trees, taking pictures, having brought lunch sacks because uh, racial terror was the order of the day. And the reminder is, the difference is, is that we have another pictorial from January the 6th that adds to without sanctuary, except this time it's extending beyond the, the narrow confines of racial terror. And it's now starting to affect even other white people. And until we deal with that sinister virus that is spreading probably faster and more persistently than COVID-19 has for the last year and a half. Uh, you'll see another January 6th sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Erie. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you back and engaged in this discussion. Uh, let's move to Karen York. Um, why are white supremacist culture and ideology so difficult to identify, confront, and address? How do these re realities serve as a threat to reimagining restorative justice in a manner that identifies structural racism as the actual crime and offense in systems built by white supremacy? Karen York, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Kevin. Always a pleasure. Um, many thanks to the team at Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, and of course, a pleasure to join my fellow panelists, everyone except Reverend Yeri. Um, you know, my colleagues have stated it so eloquently that there's not much that I can add. Um, however, there's one thing that I think, um, you know, is a driving force uh, when it comes to why it's so difficult uh, for us to have these conversations, for us to move away from the current system. Um, that allows white supremacy to operate um, both indirectly um, and directly, but in an insidious manner, uh, as Tara indicated. Money. So recently, um, a colleague and I were, and actually this was literally 24 hours ago, a colleague was lamenting about how we cannot pass this one bill. And we've been trying to pass this bill for over 10 years. This is a bill that would prohibit car insurance companies from using non-driving factors and auto insurance premiums. Car insurance companies are able to use things like, you know, um, credit, income, education, all of these race neutral factors that actually ensure that individuals, certain individuals are gonna be paying more in auto insurance. Um, all the stats and research show that this falls disproportionately on black and brown communities. However, we cannot seem to pass legislation that would provide any relief to these individuals. And a colleague was like, I don't get it. We have all the stats, we've done everything. What is the issue? Money, okay? You know, America, as we all know, was built on the exploitation of black bodies. It was slavery was a willful um, decision and it was based purely um, in economic reasoning. Um, and as such, there have been hordes of individuals um, who have been able to benefit um, from that willful decision. Historically, you know, it's been white folks, but now you can say that while still white folks are benefiting from that willful decision, benefiting economically, socially, you know, you name it, the fact that there have been people of color who have been allowed special access to things also complicates the process complicates the process in a way where no one really wants to talk about the impact of white supremacy or race or how, how much white supremacy permeates almost everything um, that happens in our lives. Now it's about class. It's about opportunity. It's about access. 
instead of realizing that no, 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 it's not the same for everyone. You know, I was recently, you know, just looking through the channels trying to figure out what to watch. And the History Channel had a series on and it was like, how the middle class built America. And I was like, they spelled slaves wrong. Because this whole idea that America, right? Like this is what's out there, the middle class. But who is the middle class? Even when we're talking about how do we get out of this pandemic or even what's the way to address race equity, we always tend to go back to the same language that we use as if we are all a monolith. And so in, in the space of Job Opportunities Task Force and a lot of other things that I've seen, in addition to everything that the panelists have mentioned, we cannot forget the role of money and economics and how many times the role and the conversation around race is deprioritized so that we can actually talk about how it's really about class and it's really about opportunity instead of recognizing how class is race for many folks. Thank you. Thank you, Karen York with the Job Opportunities Task Force. Uh, Reverend Dr. Todd Yeary, so good to have you here. Uh, Tara Huffman and um, I will, uh, and, and Dr. Seema Iyer, and I will, I will turn to you here in a moment. Um, there are more than 160 individuals uh, participating in this conversation today. So I would invite you to um, introduce yourselves and uh, perhaps the organization that, that you represent in the chat. Uh, I see that some people are already making use of the chat. Um, Eddie Martin, uh, who really is a driving force behind these community of practice discussions is ensuring that there's a, a range of links to important resources that relate to the conversation that we're having today. So make sure you uh, pay attention to the, to the chat. Um, and uh, that will only uh, enrich the experience I hope that, that we are all having with this conversation today. Um, I'm going to turn to you, um, Dr. Ayer, uh, with a, a quote from a book I know that, that both of us know, um, Dr. Lawrence Brown's uh, book, The Black Butterfly, uh, The Harmful Politics of Race and Space in America. Um, uh, one individual will receive this copy of the book. We will choose it randomly and make sure that you uh, have this book after our session today. Um, in his book, the, the Black Butterfly, Dr. Brown analyzes how structural racism continues to perpetuate race-based trauma and negatively impact the health of distressed uh, populations of color. Seeing how racial equity has become a sensationalized catchphrase, Dr. Brown outlines steps that institutional leaders and government officials must take to dismantle spatial racism. I quote, restore black neighborhoods, foster healing from past harms, support collective self-determination for the future. However, the fear that many racial equity leaders, advocates and activists possess is that government officials, philanthropies, nonprofits, corporations will continue to profess what Dr. King called a high blood pressure of creeds and demonstrate an anemia of deeds when it comes to addressing racial inequities. Referencing your own work, uh, will you discuss the steps we must follow to implement a robust racial equity strategy? What has been the root of the apprehension that stifles progress in institution, institutional and government circles? Is it uh, how and why are we not um, addressing such moral imperatives? Dr. Ayer. Well, thank you so much for this question. And um, obviously thanks to Dr. Brown for his fantastic book and his fantastic work and really you know, coming up with an incredibly simple way for us to really understand what the problem is here in the city. That, that level of segregation that I mentioned is really at the heart of his, of his work. Um, and I wanna talk about two different things. And one thing that Karen said at the end that there is no monolith, even among people of uh, you know, non-white uh, persons of color. Um, 
And some of the data that we have will help understand why it's hard to kind of actually bring people together in some type of coalition. So let me give you a data, that's what I do. I'm a data person. So in the city of Baltimore, we have a, a racial gap in overall life expectancy. So the life expectancy for white Baltimoreans is 79 years. And for black Baltimoreans, it's 76 years. Uh, sorry, 76 years and 73 years. 76 for white, 73 for black. So we have a racial gap of three years. But we have two neighborhoods that are both 93% African-American. One is called Howard Park, way out in the west side of town, for those that are familiar. And another one called Clifton Berea on the east side of town. And the life expectancy, and they're both 93% African-American. In Howard Park, the life expectancy is 76 years, the same as the average for white. And in Clifton Berea, it's 66 years. Same level of racial uh, makeup if you just looked at race, but completely different experiences. And if you've been to Howard Park versus been to Clifton Berea, you can see that spatial injustice. <laughs> you know, Howard Park is a fully functioning, good, you know, older African Americans, lots of home ownership. And Clifton Berea has been devastated by years and decades of disinvestment and now sits at about 30% vacant and abandoned housing because so many people have left that neighborhood. They're both 93% African-American. And believe it or not, we actually have two neighborhoods that are white, Morrill Park in the Southwest of town that are 65% white and Guilford, which is also 65% white in the North. And I can't make this up, but they have a 10 year life expectancy gap between them as well. Um, uh, Morrill Park is actually lower than Howard Park, even though it's a 65% white, um, but then Guilford is higher than Howard Park. And so that's what hopefully the data can get us as to what it is that we really need to be looking at uh, to try and get it a question of equity. Um, so if we think back to it's and it's completely lack of investment and disinvestment and disenfranchisement in so many um, historically African American neighborhoods. So if we look at redlining, redlining was um, an act in the 1930s that you know was kind of anti-urban. They basically took any area in the United States that was very dense, which was most urban areas on the East Coast, uh, but then also anti-non-white uh, you know, populations. So high immigrant populations would also, and high persons of color would be what are called redlined. But guess what? If you look at the, red, if you look at the map for the city of Baltimore, Canton, Locust Point, downtown are all redlined neighborhoods in the 1930s map. And today, Canton is our number one highest median income neighborhood in the city of Baltimore, predominantly white. It was started off as predominantly white, even in the 1930s, but it was the immigrants of the time that were Eastern European. It was very dense housing, right? The, the density of that time, uh, but it was redlined and so was Locust Point. Um, so we have, some evidence of what it means to invest in neighborhoods. What have we done in Canton? We have done so much investment in Canton. The Boston Street was reconstructed. The Can Company, so much investment in Canton for decades. This is not a one year thing. And that kind of investment has not happened in a Sandtown Winchester or a Clifton Berea. It's not so, you know, people talk about oh, in the 1990s, we did this thing in Sandtown Winchester and we had the Sandtown Winchester rising. Uh, but if you look at how much money that was, that was pennies, pennies to the amount of reinvestment that that neighborhood actually needed. So one thing that we need to look at is what is the level of disinvestment and what is the level of reinvestment? And if the reinvestment is this much versus what the need is, we're just, we're never gonna actually change the, the, the conversation. And so hopefully that's what data can be useful for is that we need to ask for the full level of reinvestment in these neighborhoods. And this is Baltimore. It's not just African-American neighborhoods. They are African-American neighborhoods, but they are, this is Baltimore. We, we cannot just let, you know, a piece of our whole city just go to the wayside like this. And we've got to address it. And that's what I'm hoping we can start to see in some of the new policies moving forward to really address that issue of spatial injustice.
Right. Indeed. Th thank you, Dr. Ayer. I, I heard um, about a week and a half ago, Dr. Brown uh, on WYPR uh, talking about talking about his book and, and fielding a question on gentrification. Right. And, and how do we how do we kind of guard against it if that reinvestment happens? How do we how do we keep communities from from gentrifying? And, and his answer right away um, was, well, look, we, we've got we've got things like live with live where you work policies. Right. Why, why don't we have stay where you are uh, policies and invest in uh, um, uh, communities that we and, and the people living in the communities that we are reinvesting in and and just the really stressed the role of uh, of, of of public policy in in uh, ensuring both reinvestment and guarding against gentrification and and, and displacement um I'm, I'm glad you are with us we, we could spend an entire hour and a half or or longer just on the on the data that you work with on a regular basis and we'll have to have you back to spend more time uh with that data uh, I'd like to turn now uh, to Karen York. Uh, in our part one of this conversation, uh, Karen, uh, it was Tara Huffman that discussed the need to move beyond reform and create a world that stresses an abolitionist theory of change and framework where the flawed institutions and systems that we are so reliant upon uh, should become obsolete and where, quote, we are not seeking retribution, but restoration, reconnection, and reconciliation. Uh, for people of color who have arguably been estranged from society for their entire lives, and even for generations, what does restoration, reconnection, and reconciliation even look like, considering, as we've been talking about, 400 years, as Dr. Yuri noted, of terror, and violence, slavery, Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, et cetera. Are restoration, reconnection, and reconciliation even possible? Uh, what, what are we missing and, and what are the solutions? Yeah, so, you know, in answering uh, that question, and, you know, I applaud um, Tara and many of my colleagues. Um, you know, have applauded Tara for some time for being willing, particularly within the philanthropic circles, um, to, you know, push her colleagues to change the game in terms of how we talk about the things. Um, and then of course, you know, update and change their approaches accordingly. Um, and changing the game, a big piece of that comes with um, semantics. It comes with identifying the proper, more accurate terminology to actually define what it is that is occurring and or what we seek to have happen. Um, but even within that context, I think it's important, given what we're talking about, who we're talking about, even within that context, um, and, and please, you know, forgive me, I'm still a little cynical from the 2021 legislative session. So, you know, it'll be over in a month. Um, but even within that context, it's warranted cynicism. I'm um, just just saying a whole other webinar we can have, whole other webinar. Um, but you know, even within that context, you know, I think trust. We have to recognize that trust is real, okay. And and when I say trust is real, meaning the lack of trust that communities just have for even me at times, right? And the work that has to be done to ensure that the living situations and conditions in our history. Yes, those are very real, but how can we start to build those levels of trust that will allow us to start to understand and accept um, these new terms? Because the other piece is that context is important. And context is important when you're going to change terms or when you're going to use new terminology because one, that distrust is there. And many times because that distrust is there, it's like, oh, we're just coming up with a new term for it. And, and the reason why is because unfortunately, a number of individuals and many times even our own allies have found a way to bastardize the terms that we, you know, come up with that we feel better define the issues. And there are a number of, of examples, right? So, I mean, you could look at Black Lives Matter, all of a sudden it was All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Mamas Matter, All Dogs Matter. It was, I mean, it was a thing, right? You have progressive. I hate the term progressive now. I don't even know what it means because we have progressive legislators that are voting for mandatory minimums. So I'm confused out here. Urban reform, right, now really means gentrification. And even gentrification, you actually have folks that are trying to redefine gentrification as a good thing, 
right? When Webster's is very clear about what gentrification is, in addition to we all see and know what gentrification is and does to our communities. Um, and so I think it's when we are talking about, um, you know, using um, new terms and it's absolutely warranted, we also have to be very clear about the context in which we're providing and understand that the communities um, that are, you know, we're hoping to receive this and operate with these new terms um, are distressful because the new terms recycle, recycle. And so what that looks like is couple those new terms with things like reimagining and shattering and dismantling systems. An example of that is, you know, just using JOTF, Historically, we would focus on reentry. How do we help individuals that have matriculated through the criminal justice system and help them get jobs? We now realize that if you're operating in Baltimore City, there's no way in the world that you can just talk about what's happening on the back end without talking about why are folks even going in on the front end? Significant segment of the working population effectively unemployable as a result of their interaction with the criminal justice system. So on the front end, you take a bail fund and instead of sending folks to bail bondsmen, instead of sending them to private companies, you insert some community based organizations where they're able to define what community supervision looks like, what um, community public safety looks like, be able to partner with systems in a way where we're not relying on these traditional um, operations and policies and practices that we know are steeped in white supremacist, racially coded language and policies that have a disproportionate impact on people of color. And so there, there are definitely ways that, you know, we can go about it without recycling, you know, many of the old terms, but using these new terms, liberation, abolitionist, reimagine, shattering, disrupting, and then coupling that with actual um, actions and practices to show um, that they're doable and the sky won't fall. So New York, you're getting lots of affirmative responses in the chat here uh, with people saying uh, that's exactly right and, and contributing to the conversation. Uh, Ms. Tara Huffman, I'd like to turn to you and give you an opportunity uh, to respond uh, to Ms. York. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on Karen's perspectives? Karen identifies uh, something that I think that um, a lot of us who are in this space, you know, have all had of our, our own personal evolutions. You know, you start one way with one way of thinking, one philosophy, one paradigm, and then the longer you're in this work, you realize, oh, wait a minute, I, like I'm I'm nowhere near where I need to be. I still have some internalized racial and forward in, inferiority that I'm dealing with, and so we start to excavate all of that stuff. And as we're doing it. As I said um, on the last uh, during the last conversation, I would not, you know, ten years ago, maybe maybe five years ago. Time is slipping away from me, so let me let me stick stick with ten. Happens ten years ago, <laughs> yes, you know, we all lost a whole year during the pandemic. So I would say, um, ten years ago, I would not have characterized myself as an abolitionist. I would have said that that's crazy. What are you talking about? You can't get rid of prisons. <laughs> like, like there's always going to be a few people that we just don't need around us right now. Like, I want you to be treated humanely while you're in prison, but we probably we need to hold on to prisons, right? Ten years ago, I would not have been able to imagine a world um, without law enforcement, traditional law enforcement as we know it today. But you live, right? You live, you learn in this world, you see what's happening, the, you get proximate. Um, Brian Stevenson talks about getting proximate. You start to get proximate to the issues that you say you fight for and that you advocate for. And that's when you, you, you come to realize that simply reforming what is, is not going to get us to liberation. Um, and it's not gonna get us to mutual uh, liberation. Um, it truly, you do have to not just use the terms, but take actions towards disruption, dismantling, completely reimagining what would it look like to just tear everything that exists, just tear it down and build something in its place. And you always have an urgency about you, especially when you're younger, you always have this urgency like it has to happen now. Um, but then, you know, you hold that urgency and you also begin to develop like, no, this is like a two, three generation strategy, right? So what do I need to do right now to start immediate harm? But also how do I begin to sort of reorient my thinking and reorient my actions towards a strategy that is 10, 20, 30, 40 years long? Um, because that's the kind of thinking that you have to have. This stuff was not built, what we see was not built overnight. 
it was not built in a five year span. It was 400 years plus in the making and it's going to take a long time to undo it. And I just came to understand that people who are using words like dismantling and abolition, that's what they're thinking, right? They're thinking 40, 50, 60 years, right? They're not saying we're gonna tear down all the Maryland prisons tomorrow. They're like, how do we create a world where what we have come to rely on, even when it is um, oppressing us, how do we create a world where those things become obsolete? And how do we create a world where we then um, also obtain the power? There's a shift in power, whether that power is wealth, whether that power is status, whether that power is who's at the table making these decisions. How do you shift that so that different decisions are made and you do have people who are in those rooms who are willing to reimagine, right? And who are willing to sit with the fear of like, I don't know what it looks like it to equip the community to police itself. None of us know what that looks like because none of us have ever, none of us contemporarily have lived in that world, right? We might be able to cite examples from our ancestors a long, long time ago. We used to take care of each other, right? And take care of their communities. But for us, we're gonna have to relearn it, reimagine it, build something new. And there can be a fear, there can be an anxiety that comes up when you're doing that. But we have to be comfortable with sitting with that, right? And not being, not allowing it to drive us to holding on to what is because we know it and it doesn't work right. So we'll do our best to fix it as opposed to saying, you know what? No, we just gotta let that go in its entirety and come together and build something new. And, 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 to, and, and then ask the question, even let go of the lie that the something new is gonna be at my expense, hmm. right? Right. Um, but that the, what we're building, the, the, the new thing that we're building has the potential to mutually benefit all of us um, in a world where there is not white supremacy and white privilege does not equal a world where whites are therefore subjugated and oppressed, <laughs> right? They become the new black, right? <laughs> Blacks become the new white and whites become the new black, right? That's the, that's the mythology, right? Like if you let them get too much power, if you build this world, then you know, whites will become the new black and blacks will become the new white. And we have to be willing to sort of sit and imagine a world where there is no black and white. Like we all get to benefit. We all get to thrive, not just survive. We all get to thrive. And what does that world look like? But it does take imagination. Um, and it does take, uh, it takes uh, an urgency coupled with uh, patience um, right. um, and, and, and holding those two things at the same time, which is a challenge. And you know, and it can be mentally taxing, but that's what we have to be. We have to be able to do. We have to be able to hold both things at the same time. Absolutely, T Tara. I was struck by, and, and so many um, participants in this conversation last time in, in part one uh, were so struck by your um, uh, very, very personal description of that evolution from reformist mm -hmm. to abolitionist, and 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 just that. Uh, I, I think it meant a lot to individual participants reflecting on their own lives uh, in, in, in kind of understanding that, that progress. And, and what you're really getting at as well is with that longer view is working toward an outcome that we ourselves in our lifetimes uh, may never in fact see the, the end result of that, right? And that's a, that's a, um, a necessary but, but uh, difficult mindset uh, a, 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 though an essential one to, to put oneself into. Um, let, let's transition a bit in this discussion uh, by introducing our next poll and putting a, putting a concept in that poll on the table. Reparations. A, uh, we, we've, been, we've been talking about loaded words and words that mean lots of things to lots of different people. Let, let's talk about this one. I believe that reparations, choose, choose all that, uh, that apply here, multiple choice, should be considered and administered to people of color, specifically black individuals and communities, augmented by reforms in our institutions, should not be considered or administered, should be reimagined beyond compensatory justice and implemented are complicated and could create more inequities, will end structural and institutional racism, will not end racism in the US. Spend some time reflecting on those. We can see the responses come in. More than half here observing that um, 
reparations will not end racism in the US, uh, but the majority here should, should indeed be considered uh, for people of color, specifically black individuals and communities. Tara, let's, uh, let's go back to you here with this next question and, and stay in this conversation. Um, in his book, We Were Eight Years in Power, Tanahisi Coates helps us reimagine reparations as a form of restorative justice that transcends compensatory justice, if you will. He states, and I quote, what is needed is an airing of family secrets, a settling with old ghosts. What is needed is a healing of the American psyche and the banishment of white guilt. What I'm talking about is more than recompense for past injuries, more than a handout, a payoff, hush money, or a reluctant bribe. What I'm talking about is a national reckoning that would lead to spiritual renewal, a revolution of the American consciousness, a reconciling of our self-image as the great democratizer with the facts of our history. In our country, where white supremacist ideology is, as was noted earlier in this conversation, etched into our systems, institutions, and even ourselves, should reparations be provided uh, to black indigenous and people of color? Uh, if so, how should they be reimagined and how, sh how should they be imagined rather and implemented? Um, thank you uh, for that. And I would um, commend the audience to um, the Reparations Now Toolkit um, that was developed by the Movement for Black Lives. Um, if you Google move, move, Movement for Black Lives and then Reparations Now Toolkit, um, because they lay out some principles, some very critical principles of what uh, true reparations uh, looks like. Because um, if it is just cutting someone a check, that in and of itself is not reparations. That is part of reparations. Part of reparations should be making restitution. Um, and, and restitution uh, can be monetary, uh, but that is, that is only part um, of the story. Um, the rest of the story is that in order for reparations to truly occur, there has to be an acknowledgement of the harm. And so you, you see that in political circles, um, you know, there is this uh, campaign now uh, to demonize critical race theory um, and to ban the teaching of it and in all of its forms um, from school systems. Um, because there continues to be a denial and to your point a violent uh, denial um, of the white, su white supremacy um, and its role in building um, this country and sustaining what is. Um, and in order for reparations to truly occur, there has to be an acknowledgement of America's white supremacist um, foundations and structures. Um, you can't just wink and nod at it. Um, you just can't issue a resolution and keep it moving. Um, that acknowledgement has to be a reteaching of American history um, and a truthful reteaching of American history that in many respects is gonna be completely contradictory um, to the teaching that most of us, the overwhelming majority of us received um, in our public school settings and even in our higher education settings. So that has to be part of reparations. Um, and then there has to be restitution, but uh, part of the reparation is that there also has to be a cessation, a cessation of the harms. You have to stop doing the thing that is causing the harm. And so if I apologize to you for the harm that I've done to you and I give you a check, but then I keep doing it, right? There continues to be an over-policing. There continues to be over-incarceration. There continues to be um, these extremely disparate outcomes that we see in maternal health, right? Um, and infant mortality among people of color. All of the things that we have cited today and, and so much more that we um, have not even said, there has, so you have to stop. So the reparation story has to be identifying all of the ways that harm continues to be perpetuated on people because of who they are specifically, 
um, on basis of race and ethnicity, and then we have to stop it. Like you have to identify the rule, the policy, the practice that is currently in place, and you have to stop it. You have to reimagine it. You have to amend it. I mean, that's just a bit, bit of a plug. That's part of the um, the objective of the People's Commission to decriminalize Maryland, right? We're going through the Maryland code and identifying all of the laws that we can that target people based on their identity and criminalize them based on their identity. The conduct is really just a red herring for their identity or it's a proxy, I should say, for their identity and saying, and so Maryland, you need to completely um, delete this law from the code or you need to amend the law in a way that gets at whatever the harmful criminal conduct you're trying to get at, um, but doesn't um, target someone because of their identity and conduct that they engage in um, for survival purposes. Um, and then there's the whole divest invest, right? Because if you're making reparations, that means that um, to Seema's point, you have to go back to all of those communities that did not get the level of investment that they got. And so, yes, and so there's sort of reparations on the individual level that I might get an individual compensation, but then there's community reparations, right? Which comes in the form of investments um, in the community infrastructure that has not been invested in um, over these last decades um, so that the community also can rise. Um, so all of that is part of reparations. And if any piece of that is missing, you don't truly have reparations. And so people who critique rex restorations, they get stuck on the money, right? right? They don't want to do the money or they say, well, that's what welfare folks for, right? right? Welfare was reparations, the Pell Grants. Uh, were reparations, right? They start citing all of these government benefits um, and saying, well, we've already done reparations, right? Um, but that's not that's not reparations. Uh, we can have a whole conversation about that. That is not reparations. <laughs> There's a whole nother level of reparations that black and brown people and other people of color are owed in this nation. And the money, the piece, that piece is only one part of it. And we have to do all of it in order for it to truly be reparations. Thank you, Tara Huffman. And one of the things that you, you mentioned specifically is the importance of, of education. Um, and, and you earlier, uh, Dr. Yuri, referenced um, uh, the, the importance of, of, of policy and also referencing the, the importance of, of education. But yet we know right now that there are um, efforts to enshrine in policy attempts to prevent the kind of education, uh, the truthful education about our history uh, that we need to engage in in this country. So I, I, I want to give you, uh, Todd, a, a couple of minutes to respond uh, to, uh, to Tara Huffman's thoughts and, and, and particularly to reflect on this if indeed, and I think we would agree that education, that true education is so important, and yet we're also facing um, uh, uh, political efforts to prevent it, how do we begin to get around that? Well, that's, that's a full question, right? We can't resolve it, but let's see if we can kind of lay out four major I think uh, groupings of actions. And, and I think you have representation uh, of all of these in this conversation. So the first to Tara's point is legislation, going through the code and identifying laws that are unjust, but enforced, right? Uh, that, that's, that's a lot of effort, but it, it's necessary. So we've got to have legislation. Where we can't get changes to the laws, we have to challenge them. The, the way we got civil rights movement in the first place was through test cases. We've got to do litigation. We know the litigation landscape is kind of challenging at the federal level because the bench was stacked by um, a degree of incompetence that should make any white person cringe to ever raise the issue about affirmative action because this incompetence defies all reason. Uh, there's, there needs to be more demonstration. We, we've got to keep advocating. Um, Karen York is an advocate. She says she'll get past this uh, legislative session in another, I think she said month or so, but then she's gonna start focusing on what the next fight is gonna look like. We have to stay engaged. And when that doesn't work, what we're seeing across the country is moving from demonstration, which is often you know, kind of structured to agitation, which is harder to predict and more difficult to control, but it's, it's channeled in a way that gets folks' attention. And here's how it got folks' attention. 
the agitation of the last year uh, moved corporations to dedicate a little over eight, maybe nine billion dollars toward uh, the conversation around racial justice. And that sounds pretty impressive when we think about investment. The problem is corporations in America in the fourth quarter made two trillion dollars in profit. That's, that's not justice, that's called self-protection. This is real easy. We can't keep assuming that we're gonna sell out this notion of restitution and Tara's right on the word. We keep using reparations and it's a trigger, but the legal term is restitution. What will it take to make folks whole for the violence, the psychic trauma, the economic harm, the persistent, consistent, ongoing harm that goes on in the microaggressions of bad policy that are passed and implemented and enforced every single day. When you have a Supreme Court that can say that law enforcement officers don't really need to know the law, they just have to reasonably believe the law that they're trying to enforce is a law, that everything else that flows from a bad traffic stop under those conditions, if it's, if it's worthy enough, you can actually protect it. Well, wait a minute. I'd love to have a job where I don't need to know how to do my job and still draw a check and affect the liberty of other people. Where else can you do that? Why didn't we think of that sooner? The, 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 the asinine notions that we have about what this looks like uh, I think just kind of boggles the mind. But that's why when you when you, you can't argue with data, that's why Seema's work is so critical. It's no longer emotional, it's quantified. Karen's work is critical. She's in the room where it happens, arguing for just issues. Uh, Tara's in the philanthropic space, trying to make sure that we're doing the work and, and, and organizing those dollars to make sure that we get to this notion. And I wanna say this, reparations are not meant to end racism. That's not what reparations are for. Let's drop that from a conversation that the whole point of providing restitution to folks who have been harmed is to get rid of the thing that motivated the harm in the first place. That ain't our job, that's y'all's job. So let's stop thinking that somehow or other, I've got to absolve you of some historical guilt where now uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones can't get tenure at her alma mater because politically they didn't like the telling of the story from the perspective of the 1619 project. But I saw none of them jokers say nothing about the 1776 report when it got published under the last administration. So let's stop playing this notion that somehow or other this is a nicey nicey thing. We cannot precondition. I wanna say this to Tara's point because she's real clear on this. We gotta stop placing preconditions on the outputs to determine what the inputs need to be. If I have to convince you that somehow or other doing right is going to fix some issue that you have that's gonna somehow make you feel less threatened, that somehow or other black people who get justice are gonna start treating white people the way white people have been treating black people for 400 years. That's first of all, that's not who we are. If that were the case, that would have happened a long time before now. Where else are you gonna go and be able to live in reasonable decency and harmony with people that you beat the hell out of, you shackled, you sold like human cattle, you denied how you violated women's bodies as a matter of right, and then take the love story between uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, quote unquote, the love story, when in really that is justified pedophilia anywhere else that we go. So let's stop dealing with this asinine, untrue, immoral conversation and let's just kind of deal with it on its face. It is time for us to be a just nation if we're going to be a nation at all. And that is the bottom line. It is time for us to be a just nation if we're going to be a nation at all. Uh, Todd Yuri, uh, thank you for that. Uh, everyone, I draw your attention to the Q&A box. Uh, please direct uh, questions to that box. We'll be coming up to that segment very shortly. Uh, but first, we have our fourth poll. Let's put that, that up on the screen here. Which form of racism is most important to address? Individual? Interpersonal, structural and systemic, internalized, or none of the above? About 85% of respondents at systemic and structural. Pretty high there. I'm, str I'm struck by, anyone else struck by how uh, the, the, the relatively low percentage of individual and interpersonal? Well, first, I probably would say that you have a um, 
uh, an informed audience. <laughs> so <laughs> if you were to do this same poll on the streets, right, go out on the streets of Baltimore down in the Inner Harbor or up at Towson Town Center, I don't know, you might get a slightly different um, answer. Uh -huh. um, but I but I but I'll go ahead, but I'll add to that that uh, the, I think that that um, I think the response demonstrates that at least with a segment of the population, the advocacy and the messaging is penetrating. Like people are starting to get it, um, and the recent events, you know, whether you know in Baltimore City, you know, 2015 is almost like a BCAD. Um, you know, I think uh, recent events and recent, you know, being in the last, you know, even six or seven years, I think have presented enough information that even people who at one time um, didn't acknowledge it or thought it was isolated. Let me we thought that these incidents were isolated. I think that they have been, I think because of social media, because of the media, because of stories and things of that nature, even because of art, you know, movies and things of that nature, yeah. um, I think that they're being confronted uh, with the reality that these are not isolated incidents. It's not a few bad apples, right? This is not the act of a couple of racists who just happen to be in positions of power, but there's something really wrong here yeah. um, that is inexplicable. You can't justify it or explain it away with those um, phrases that I, you know, I just used. Um, and therefore there's an eye opening, like this is bigger than just an individual, right? This is bigger than just, you know, one organization. There's something going on there. And I might know, I may not be able to name it, <laughs> but I know it's something that be, is beyond just the individual. It, it is indeed though, you know, I have to say here from the perspective of a well-meaning nonprofit organization. I mean, we, when we started as an organization of uh, really having uh, uh, meaningful and ever deeper uh, conversations about, about racial equity, um, so, so many of us, and I know I'm guilty of this historically, go immediately to the systemic and the structural. And to what extent does that not uh, allow us or absolve us, if you will, of on focusing on the very real individual and interpersonal forms of racism that continue to persist within our institutions, right? Well, I, I mean, to yes, go to my know. earlier point, it's because we have such systemic and structural racism, we can't even get to a point where we're talking to each other for the interpersonal, right? We can't even get to that because we've like, we have these policies that keep us so far flung. And I think that's why it's not that not all, all of them are absolutely important, but until we actually address that structural racism, we can't even get to the point where we're, like I said, we can't even live together, right? And to get to know each other and, and actually have a community and formulate trust because that's what trust is built on, right? You have to interact with somebody to build some trust. Right. Um, so I think that's hopefully, you know, maybe what Tara's saying is that, you know, it's so obvious that you know, if we don't address one, we're never gonna get to the rest. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Geary, let, let me turn to you here for a second. You, you and I have talked this, about this a lot in the past. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a pastor's kid, grew up in the church. Uh, you're, you're a minister very much in the church. Um, we, we often look to faith-based organizations and institutions uh, to serve as sources of truth, healing, justice, redemption, especially for those who are poor and distressed. However, in the cases of white supremacy and racism, history has shown us that the church has often been used to advance and crystallize that status quo of racism um, in local, state, and national, or even federal contexts, which has perpetuated the suffering of so many people for generations. A faith leader and author, Jim Wallace, refers to racism as, uh, quote, America's original sin, and calls for the church and greater society to repent by denouncing racism on the pathway towards redemption. Given many faith-based institutions' ties to white dominant ideology, is it possible for the church or other faith-based organizations to become anti-racist? What does uh, restoration and redemption look like? Well, you, you probably put your finger, first, let me, let me say I, I feel for you being a PK, uh, being, being a pastor, I know that that probably had its, its, uh, its share of challenges. Let, let's first put it in context, right? The, 
uh, the institutional church, the, the, the network of local congregations, uh, by and large, for the most part, were not mostly active in the social justice movements of the day. Many of them kind of sat out, watched. They may have prayed a little bit, but by, yeah, for the most part, you didn't have like mass demonstrations of congregations rolling out into the street saying, we denounce this. As a matter of fact, if we look at the history, some of your meanest, nastiest slave owners, pastor churches, mm -hmm. uh, denominations were created over this internal disagreement of whether or not the notion of redemption applied to enslaved black bodies. If we convert them, must we now liberate them as part of our duty and obligation? And so there, there's, there's a complicated history there when we look at uh, what the role of churches, maybe we think it ought to be, but Dr. King wrestled with it too. Letter from Birmingham jail was not because he had a whole lot of friends coming to sign up to visit him while he was in the jail, it was because he had to tell his peers to get off the sidelines and get invested and involved in the process of racial justice in America. And it's still an issue. When you look at uh, some of the, the biggest enablers of the former occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, they were faith leaders. They came up with all kinds of asinine twists of how you take the holy writ and use it to justify immoral behavior. So uh, I think we just need to, to just kind of say, look, go with those who get it, those who don't, don't spend a whole lot of time trying to convince or convert them. Because at the end of the day, at the, at the anchor of our perspective of faith, uh, I didn't see a whole lot of folks at Calvary defending the Christ either. So we got to figure out who's going to be our 12. And when one falls out, who are we going to replace? And we roll with the crew that's going to get it done and the rest of them can catch up if they want to. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeri. Let, let's try to get to a couple of questions here as time is quickly evaporating. Um, and and uh, let me bring uh, you back into this conversation, Karen. This question comes from Catherine Crossland, who's a, a doctor at one of our sister agencies in Washington, D.C., uh, Unity Healthcare. She, she notes that at a National Healthcare for the Homeless Council meeting yesterday, uh, some folks suggested adding race into the prioritization system uh, for getting housing for people experiencing homelessness. That organization was told by their legal counsel uh, that they couldn't do that because of the Fair Housing Act. I'm curious about how to create something akin, uh, akin to affirmative action in terms of housing and reparations and would love, would love your thoughts. Would you like to take that one? Um, yes and no, um, because I am, I, well, in all honesty, I'm not an attorney. Um, and so I don't ever want to speak in a way to give anyone any legal advice in terms of how to ensure that your legislation passes legal muster when it comes to the Fair Housing Act. I'm very clear about that. I have a whole legal brain trust that I rely on. Um, and so, you know, Tara, of course, if you have any comments on that, our newly minted attorney, Reverend Yeri, just wearing a whole bunch of hats around here, um, absolutely uh, speak up, but you know, there is something that I want to um, mention when it comes to the Fair Housing Act and how many times um, you could have language that is um, not necessarily doesn't explicitly speak to a particular racial group, um, but the impact um, has a particular impact on the racial group. Um, and quite honestly, that is when you ask whether or not someone has a criminal background. Um, this is one of those questions that many times is used to determine, um, it's a filtering mechanism, but a lot of times it's used to, it's, it's a trigger, it's a, it's a way to be able to um, identify who is who without having them check that box of race. Um, and you're finding that, I mean, we've seen this, you know, in employment, and it still is an issue in employment. Um, but we're seeing it more and more in housing. And I know Healthcare for the Homeless um, has been one of our you know, closest partners um, in efforts to reduce the impact um, of incarceration when it comes to housing. Um, a lot of times we like to decouple the two, but I mean, think about it on a job application. What's the second question? I mean, almost on any application, um, the second question is gonna be address, your mailing address. Um, and there are policies in place. You can't say you can't house black people, you can't house brown people, right? You can't say that, right? But you can say that 
you know, we, um, housing is going to be prohibited to individuals with certain prior offenses, which then, of course, um, when it comes to public housing, extends to family members of those individuals that may have interacted uh, with the criminal justice system. So, I mean, that I know that totally does not answer your question, but if you're looking at a way to kind of circumvent, maybe, you know, pay attention also to how the language around criminal history um, or criminal records um, is used. Um, as a way to either ensure that it's not being used against them or think mm -hmm. creatively about how you can use that to ensure folks get access. But I'll leave it up to the lawyers. Well, I'll just say, I think, um, you know, the word I would use um, that Karen didn't use was just proxy. We, we, we know how proxies have been used against marginalized communities. They can also be used for marginalized communities. And so, um, I mean, I can see, I, I don't know the Fair Housing Act um, backwards and forwards, but I can just in my head imagine the language that's in the Fair Housing Act that would prevent you from um, articulating that you are um, giving preference to a certain race or ethnicity, because the whole point is that, like, that's not the Fair Housing Act, like, we're not going to do that, right, because it was happening, you know, in the favor of white folks, and so, but you can't flip it and do it in favor of black and brown folks, but, you know, uh, you know, using the data, you know, even some data that um, Seema um, talked about at the top of the thing, you, you know, maybe you say, so we're going to prioritize housing individuals um, who were born and raised in Clifton Berea, <laughs> right? You didn't use the word black, <laughs> you just said Clifton Berea, and you know all the stats and the data is going to support the fact that, um, you know, you're going to be given priority to persons, you know, of certain, um, certain groups. And so um, until we're able um, to be very race uh, deliberate in our conversations in a way that is actually designed to be hurt, um, helpful as opposed, as opposed to hurtful. There are ways that we can use, I think there are ways that we can use the data um, to our advantage and just base our criteria um, using the data points, you know, to, we cannot specifically call out race or gender or age or anything like that. And like I said, and we can use that for good, right? You know, there's lies, damn lies, and there's, there's statistics, right? But there's a way to use data as a force for good because that's what we should be using it for. And, you know, Dr. Iyer will be want, happy to have a conversation with you about here's the data. So use the data to set your criteria about how you're going to direct that program, that service, or that that, that Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, thank you, Karen York <laughs> and Tara Hoffman. Our, our next question, Kevin, actually. Kevin, before you go past that, yep. there is a specific answer to that question. HUD Section 3 yep. addresses framing policies around low-income and very low-income persons. It is based on earnings. And we know that the disparities that often follow race also follow income and earning and wages. And so I would say to them, look at the language of section three of the Fair Housing Act and have your legal counsel advise you on how best to frame whatever it is you're trying to do around the language of section three. Excellent. We're all going to put up, pull up uh, section three of the Fair Housing Act. And if we can find the link to it, I'm sure that Eddie will share it if he hasn't uh, already. Uh, I, I'm gonna direct uh, one final question here to you, Dr. Ayer. Uh, this comes from uh, Levita Bassetti uh, at Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, she writes, Dr. Ayer, you mentioned the disparity between two predominantly African-American neighborhoods in Baltimore and mentioned briefly the impact on their economic, social, and health outcomes. I'd love to know uh, what you think uh, we need to do to begin to change the trajectory for people in communities like Berea Edison. Um, so yeah, I've become a data vigilante, I think, since Freddie Gray in particular, because people do use data for sensationalistic things and in all the wrong ways. And so I actually now, I used to kind of let it go, like, okay, whatever, that's their business. But now I'm on top of you. If you use our data wrong, I'm gonna come after you and I'm gonna call you out and I'm gonna say that's wrong and we're gonna have a conversation. So please use our data. And if I call you, it's because I want you to use it in a way that actually gets to what you want, right? This idea of improving the lives of people in neighborhoods. And what the good thing about the data is, is that it shows how neighborhoods are impacted by different policies in different ways. So for example, Bel Air Edison was swept up during the 2007, 2008 housing market crisis where homeowners could not sell their homes. And so what they did instead was turn to the renter market, which is the housing choice voucher because that's exactly the price point for the housing choice voucher. And so we literally watched 
Bella Edison plummet in home ownership, the housing market has gone, has tanked. And instead, rational individual homeowners are selling or renting their, their units instead. Um, but that didn't just happen in Bella Edison, that happened in Pigtown, and that also happened in Edmondson Village. And so how can we get those three neighborhoods with three different council persons to build a coalition to address this issue? Should we be converting the renters that are there into homeowners? Because that's a good home ownership neighborhood. Why is the price point for the voucher exactly at that level? And maybe that's a structurally racist thing in and of, in and of itself, um, that the prices don't range more. Uh, there's no housing choice voucher utilization in Canton because the prices there are quote unquote too high for the voucher, but the voucher doesn't have to be like that. So really having this conversation, but it does, it takes time to really think about involving so many people into solutions and, but the data provides at least a common ground of where you wanna go. I knew, thank you, Dr. Ayer. I knew this uh, hour and a half would absolutely evaporate. Uh, I'd like to ask Ross to put up our final poll. Um, my readiness to become anti-racist. Choose one only, not a not a multiple choice as uh, as in past ones. I'm I'm very ready, not at all ready, somewhat ready. Don't understand what it means. Not comfortable with anti-racist philosophies. Eighty-nine percent. Uh, saying that they are very ready. Um, let us, uh, let's begin with uh, one, or let's end rather. I wish we were just beginning this conversation uh, with one final question. And we're gonna do a minute each here. Um, if you could equip participants with one tangible way they can integrate anti-racist principles, policies, or actions into their work or livelihood to repair harm and promote community healing, what would it be and why? Um, Dr. Ayer, let's, uh, let's start with you. Um, I'm gonna go back to learn to live together. So um, take a look at your neighborhood right now uh, and look at how diverse it is and figure out what you can do right now in where you live to get to know your neighbors, uh, who's selling properties in your house, who's renting properties, who are they renting to? If they're not even opening up the market to people of different races and different um, incomes, uh, you're never gonna get a diverse neighborhood because of the, there's, no, there's no throughput in it. And when we all learn to live together and um, it, it's an intentional thing to not live in a segregated society. That's our, that's our individual reality. You have to actually be very intentional to not live in a segregated neighborhood. Um, and hopefully that's something that we can think about doing right now in an intentional way. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ayer. Uh, Dr. Todd Yeri, one, one tangible thing. I'm gonna draw on an old commercial. There's an adage from an old shampoo commercial. You tell two friends and they'll tell two friends and so on and so on and so on. We'll use the Fabergé principle that justice work is not a silent partnership. Uh, it requires engagement. It's not about getting to the majority of folks. It's to get to critical mass. And if we just start recruiting one person at a time, folks who are willing to, to invest in the, the, the process of social change, which is trial and error, it's art, not science. If we continue to do that and be willing to make sure that as we make mistakes, we fix them and we keep on working toward the greatest goal for the greatest good, I think we're gonna be just fine. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yeri. Karen York, uh, one tangible way that uh, participants can integrate anti-racist principles, policies and actions into their work or livelihood. I say be vulnerable. Um, I think a lot of times when these conversations come up, folks are very quick to you know, move to their comfort level um, and it's a very defensive comfort level. Um, but be vulnerable, be open uh, to going past your comfort level. Um, there, you know, I remember last year, there were a lot of folks that kept asking like, have you seen Just Mercy? Have you seen Just Mercy? And I'm like, yes, of course it was great. But have you seen When They See Us? Mm -hmm. Silence. Um, and so I want that same energy 
when you're telling me to, you know, engage in something that allows you to feel more comfortable and I'm suggesting something that takes you out of your comfort zone that could, you know, offer a bit more guidance and insight. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Tara Huffman, uh, one tangible thing. I would say, uh, make sure you understand what it means to be anti-racist. Because hmm. 89% of the participants said that they were anti-racist and I, 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 just make sure you understand, I'm gonna use a very simple analogy. So this is a cup, right? So let's say if I'm feeling the cup, right? I'm, 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 I'm racist, right? A lot of people think that anti-racism means that I'm not feeling the cup. Hmm. No, anti-racist is what are you doing to empty the cup? So it's not enough just to not be doing something that perpetuates racism. It's what are you doing to intentionally undo the racism that has been done? And so um, I can invite my, my uh, so I can uh, uh, encourage my white son to have black friends. That's great. Are you also to Seema's point, including your son's black friend in your circle and making opportunities available to him and then figuring out how to become an ally to him and his family and being ready to call out racism or discrimination when you see it, right? So it's not just enough to be a nice person. What are you doing to intentionally undo any harm or go against a culture that is oppressing someone particularly because of their race or their, their um, ethnicity. Don't just be neutral. You actually got to be anti, right? You got to become a force of opposition too. Um, and so that's what it means to be anti-racist. And so make sure you understand what anti-racism means and then move into that. Tara Huffman, Karen York, Reverend Todd Yeary, Dr. Seema Ayer, um, thank you for uh, spending time in this conversation uh, this afternoon. Um, to everyone, uh, what are we doing, as Ms. Huffman notes, to empty the cup? If you've not already done so, consider how your work to integrate the principles of restorative justice into your work or livelihood to eliminate interpersonal and institutional racism, repair harm, promote community healing. How do you integrate that work? Apply a racial equity lens to your work, to the work of your agency, think concretely, develop the capacity to understand that it is not enough to be not racist, but we all must be anti-racist in our thoughts, our actions, our work. Only then can we truly start addressing racial inequities in various contexts, in, in healthcare and housing and so forth. It starts with, it starts internally, it even starts at home, even before we arrive at work. We've always had these conversations at the intersection of the personal and the professional. And I appreciate um, all of our participants today and panelists especially entering into the conversation uh, at that intersection. Uh, we will, at this year mark of the community of practice, uh, we'll be taking a brief hiatus to evaluate it you will re receive an evaluation immediately after this session. Uh, we ask that you complete it and return it. Your thoughts about this session and about how we should continue to craft future conversations are very important. I invite you to, in, uh, to join our online forum uh, on Facebook to continue our community of practice conversations. Um, if you do not want your information shared, um, uh, please send an email to communications at hchmd.org. Fundamental to a community of practice um, is that we talk to each other, uh, particularly as, as Dr. Ayer uh, noted, um, we very much hope that we can share your information with, full, with, with every participant. If you'd prefer that we not do so, uh, please let us know by the end of the day on Friday so that we can distribute the list back out in a timely fashion. Um, thank you all for spending your afternoon uh, with us. Thanks again to our panelists. It is an honor to know and work with each of you and look forward to uh, continuing uh, and deepening our collaborations uh, in the future. Have a good afternoon.